Lord, I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. I bow to you, Allah, Allah, you are my Lord. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome you here and today in we were, we will be talking about the lessons from the life of our dear prophet Yusuf عليه السلام hands up those who have heard the story of Yusuf عليه السلام all of you most of you. This is why we're talking about the lessons from the stories. So as you have recalled these stories, inshallah, tonight, <clears throat> you'll appreciate some of the benefits that we actually learn out of them. I'd like to recite a verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Yusuf, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. فَقُصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فَقُصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى Which means, and relate to them the many stories so that maybe they can reflect, think, ponder, understand. There has come to us, Allah says, there has come to you many wisdoms in their stories. But only for one type of people, these wisdoms are for, لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ For those who use their intellect, for those who use their minds, to think with. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى Allah never tells us stories forged, made up. The Muslim always tells stories that are true. And if they are false stories, then they should let their people know that they are telling a false story and that we need only the morals out of this story, such as when, for example, a gra your grandmother would have told you a story of the past and you don't know where it came from. But what she wants from it is the moral or sayings that you've heard. You're allowed to do that as a Muslim. But you need to let the people understand that they are not stories which are necessarily authentic. However, the stories that come to us in the Quran and the stories that come to us on the tongues of our messengers, of the messengers of Allah, our prophets, they are stories that have no false in them. In their facts, there is no falsehood. They are extremely accurate. And the morals in them are accurate. This is the difference between the stories which Allah relates to us and His messengers and the stories which everyone else relates to us. And I'd like to give you a very important piece of information and advice which without it, you can never follow the true, proper teachings of Islam. Brothers and sisters, listen to anyone you want. Anyone who has words of wisdom or benefit for you, listen. Go to any group you want. Go to any masjid you want. Listen to any imam you want. It doesn't matter. Go and do that. You need to explore things in this day and age. But there is one thing you have to keep in mind so that you don't go astray. Never accept anything without investigating it within your ability. Within the ability which Allah has given you in your intellect and your knowledge and your ability to research. Investigate. Don't accept anything without investigating it. And don't just reject everything without investigating it. But don't practice things or take in things that you have no evidence about. But don't deny them until you've gotten enough knowledge. This is the motto of a Muslim. 
Anywhere you want to go, go. And don't listen to anyone who tells you, brother, don't stick with that group, stick with my group. Unless they are knowledgeable people who you trust immensely, they can tell you this idea. I myself, through my life, went through many different groups, went through many different teachings. And I benefited from each one, which I couldn't benefit from the other. But the most important piece of knowledge which I learned towards the later years of my life is that never accept anything unless it has some proof or evidence. There are some pieces which I took that, didn't have, that had evidence, but later on I found out from knowledgeable people who were trustworthy that the evidence was false. What did I do? I just rejected it after having practiced it. There's nothing wrong with practicing something that was wrong based on evidence, later on finding out that it was wrong, all you need to do is say astaghfirullah al azim and mend your wrong. This is called tawbah. So you do the mistake and then you repent to Allah. And not one of us, not one of us follows 100% everything to his absolute authenticity in our deen because Either our knowledge is deficient or the people we trust gave us some wrong information deliberately or mistakenly. But what Allah looks at is not how much you know or how much you do, but the quality of what you know and the quality of what you do. You follow what is correct as much as you can and you make your heart sincere to Allah when you do it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you, don't worry. But in relation to our deen, know this for a fact. That what Allah revealed in the Quran, what Allah revealed to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, none of it is false. When I say none of it is false, it means it really happened. Any story, anything of the past, any example, any piece of wisdom, it is true and has evidence and is proven. And if you trace it, you'll find that it's true. But the deficiency is in us. When we hear, sometimes we misunderstand things. When we communicate, we may communicate wrongly. These can happen. But within your ability, investigate. And my dear brothers and sisters, be aware of one very dangerous matter. And that is blind following. A believer who believes in Allah never blind follows any piece of information. Never blind follows any human no one. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahmatullahi alayhi. Hands up if you've heard of him. Imam al-Shafi'i. So you all know that he is one of the greatest of scholars of, of the history of, in the history of Islam after the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, the Sahaba and the, the next generations that came. These, he is one of the founders of one of the schools of thought called the Shafi'i Madhab. When he stood beside, this is what his students relate about him in their books. His students say, when he stood beside the grave of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, he said to his students and to the people surrounding him, every single person's views and statements can be rejected, can be falsified one way or another, except the owner of this grave. And he pointed to the grave of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. All we need to know is that if it came from Allah and His Messenger, is it authentic? Within our ability, within the faculties which Allah gave us, alhamdulillah. That's all we need to know. For Allah says in the Quran about the Prophet He, Muhammad وسلم, never speaks out of his own desire, out of his own opinion. But he speaks by means of inspiration, by a wahi. Jibreel alayhi salam brings information from Allah to give to the Prophet sallallahu The only things the Prophet sallallahu mentions out of his opinion are worldly matters. They have nothing to do with religious matters. Such as the time when his sahabas, he passed by them one time, they were farmers, and they asked him, a messenger of Allah, what do you think, should we plant our crops now or wait? He said, plant them. When they planted them, they died. When they reproached him and said, Ya Rasulullah, you told us this and you are a truthful man. He said, I am not more knowledgeable than you about your crops and farming. 
You are the farmers, you're the experts, you should teach me. I just merely gave you my opinion. That has nothing to do with religion. Sometimes they would be going on a battle. And they'd ask the Messenger, وسلم, what do you think? And he would say, I believe that we should take this road. And they would say to him, O Messenger of Allah, is this from your own opinion or is this sent from Allah? If he said it's from my own opinion, they would say, then with all due respects, we disagree. We believe we should do it this way because we are more experienced in this land. You haven't lived here. And he would go by their opinion. For it is his manly, his human opinion. But when it was from Allah, when it was from Allah, what do you think they did? Wallahi, they wouldn't even take another breath in any disagreement at all. Absolute submission. And we already related the story of Ibrahim salam about the meaning of submission. So Allah tells us that he does not relate stories made up, but real stories, not forged stories. And I'll tell you why this verse came in Surah Yusuf in the tafsir. The reason why Surah Yusuf was revealed in the first place anyway. Does anyone know why Surah Yusuf was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the first place? Okay, this is a piece of information probably new to most of you then. There are several reasons. You know that the Qur'an, the verses of the Qur'an, the surahs, they were sent down stage by stage over a period of 23 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. That is because whenever an event happened or occurred, Allah would send down a couple of verses, a verse, a few verses, a page, 10 verses, 20 verses, sometimes a whole surah, teaching them about what just happened. And that is so that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ can understand these verses better because they have to relate it to us. We didn't live in their time. That's how the Qur'an was revealed. The, state, the story of Surah Yusuf is quite interesting because what happened was the Qur'an was being sent down talking about the stories of all the other prophets in different parts. So, one day it will talk about a part of the story of, you, of Musa salam. The next day it will come talking about a little part of the story of Abraham, Ibrahim salam. Then it will come and talk about Musa salam in another part. So it was never a story that was connected all the way from beginning to end. You know, an introduction, a body and a conclusion and that's it. The whole story from beginning to end, wrap it up. If you read the Qur'an you will find that the stories are scattered everywhere depending on the wisdoms which Allah wants to relate to us. That's because the Qur'an is not a novel. It is not a storybook. The Qur'an is not a poetry. The Qur'an is different to any book you've ever read. It's unique on its own. It is a message to the people, to the human, to connect them to Allah, to let you know who Allah is, to let you know what Allah, why Allah has put you here, how do you get to Him, what your purpose of life is. So any story that's brought, it's in order to bring out the wisdom of it, how it can benefit you, not just to sit there for entertainment, like a song you hear, or a storybook you hear, or like uh, um, uh, a thousand and one nights, you know, those, those stories, or, or a love story. No, the Qur'an is of wisdom and lessons and guidance. So what happened was, the Prophet ﷺ's people and the Jews, they started to spread a rumor they started to, to make the people not believe in the Qur'an, to make it look like, you know, to, put the, to make the Qur'an look like it's, uh, it's not valuable, it's nothing, it's not eloquent. So what they said was, to discredit the Qur'an, they said, look at this prophet of, so-called prophet of God. His powerful God, his eloquent God, cannot even tell us a story properly. It tells you stories from bits and pieces here and there. Obviously, they are wrong because they don't understand the Qur'an. They don't understand the purpose of the Qur'an. But to Allah accepted that challenge. Allah accepted that challenge and He sent down Surah Yusuf, which is a story of a prophet from beginning to end in the most eloquent, the most beautiful, the most perfectly structured story you can ever hear and you will not appreciate it until you actually are deeper in your knowledge of the Arabic language that's when you appreciate it even more in English it's going to lose a lot of its meaning 
But I'm going to, inshallah, try and make and do my best to explain this story as it appears in Surah Yusuf. Another reason, other than that, why Surah Yusuf was revealed was because it was a year in which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi was stricken, was stricken with so much grief. You know what grief is? Sadness. He was hit with two of the most extreme sadnesses or hardships. Number one, his only uncle which protected him from the people of Quraysh, Abu Talib, died. So now he became vulnerable and his people and his family to the attacks of the Mushrikeen, the Pathetheists of Quraysh. He was very saddened for his uncle and on top of that, his uncle died on the religion of his forefathers. So that even hurt the Prophet ﷺ double. In the seat of the Prophet ﷺ, you will read that the Prophet ﷺ, he was sitting at the bedside of his uncle Abu Talib and he was, he was, he was constantly repeating in his ear, Ya Ammi, my uncle, just say it. Say the word, La ilaha illallah, ashhadu laka biha yawm al qiyamah. I will witness it for you on the day of judgment. Just say it in my ear. And he'd whisper it. No one needs to hear it. And Abu Talib unfortunately said, Bal ala millati abai. No. On the way of my forefathers. Meaning, I want to die on the way of my forefathers. Unfortunately, Abu Talib did believe in the Prophet, وسلم, did support him, did believe in his message in every way. He did everything, even more than what Muslims can do in protection and support, but he failed only in one thing. That was his choice. He refused to acknowledge verbally that there is only one God, Muhammad is his messenger. And he said, on my forefathers. So what the people thought of him was more important to him in the end, unfortunately. So that was two things, but I count it as one since it's in, in Abu Talib. The next thing that hit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha also died in that same year. Khadija radiallahu anha was quite similar to the way Abu Talib was to the Prophet sallallahu in his protection and support. There is a, a narration, a little instance when the Prophet sallallahu was married to Aisha radiallahu anha. You all know who Aisha radiallahu anha is. He is the, she is the one Prophet sallallahu alayhi married after, way years after Khadija radiallahu anha died. Aisha radiallahu anha was the youngest and she was quite jealous for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She had the right to be. She had the messenger of God, of Allah, as her, pro as her husband. One time, a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sitting face to face with an old woman. And they were exchanging some kind of conversation, some words. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and her began to smile and enjoy and laugh about certain things they're talking about. Aisha radiallahu anha felt jealous, even of the old woman, subhanallah. And she's young. So she said, to, after he finished, she said, Ya Rasulallah, man tilka al-ajuz? Who is that old woman? He said, oh, she was an old friend of Khadija's, radiallahu anha, his former wife. Now it's hard for, it's, it's, it's difficult for a wife who got married to a husband who was married to someone before her, for her husband to mention the former wife. So Aisha asked her, who is this old woman? He said to her, she was, one of, she was one of the friends of Khadija. So she got a bit jealous and she said, what were you doing? She, he said, We were remembering past days. <laughs> we're talking about past moments. So that even made it worse for Aisha radiallahu anha. So then she said a statement, Alam yubdilak Allahu khayran minha. You know, she made a mistake by saying, But O Messenger of Allah, didn't Allah give you a woman better than her? Meaning, didn't He give you me, which, and I'm a little bit better than Khadija, radiallahu anha. I'm younger, I'm this and that. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi smiled, then went away. And He said to her, La wallah. No, by Allah. Allah did not exchange her with someone better. She gave me support 
at a time when I needed it, when no one else gave me support. She believed me at a time when no one else believed me. She comforted me when no one else comforted me. And Allah gave me from her children. Now Aisha radiallahu anha, she was not at a time where she needed to support the Prophet ﷺ when no one else supported him, nor did she at a time where she had to believe when no one else believed him. And Allah did not give him any children from her. So then Aisha radiallahu anha realized how important Khadija radiallahu anha was to the Prophet ﷺ and to Allah. And she said, please ask Allah to forgive me. And he did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, the Prophet ﷺ loved Aisha radiallahu anha in her lifetime. He loved her the most. Khadija radiallahu anha, the support, the comfort, the believer of the Prophet ﷺ, who also had children from the Prophet ﷺ, she died. She died in that time when he really needed her. He needed her for the mental support. He needed her for the comfort. And now his only wife was gone. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you understand how, how much grief this caused the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't know if you understand to what extent. But all I can say to you is, Ar Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was stronger than all of us in heart. He was stricken, stricken with enormous grief. So obviously, he knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there for him. And he's always there for him. Allah says in the Quran, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not abandoned you and he will ne and he never will not even the least so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to his aid on top of that in that year the Muslims were boycotted every Muslim well they had just finished from a boycott sorry and Abu Talib died so now there was hardship then Allah sent down the Surah Yusuf in order to comfort his soul and remind him of hardships of those who were before him. You know, when you're reminded of, uh, when you're stricken with some kind of hardness, you think to yourself, there's no one worse off than me. And then you start complaining. And... But when you hear about someone who is worse off than you, suddenly your problem begins to look like Insignificant. Isn't that right? Has it happened to anyone here before? Hands up if it's happened to you. I have many times, yes. Every single person. We've always had that. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told us, always look at those who are less fortunate than you. Don't look at those who are more fortunate than you in life. Because if you keep looking at those who are more fortunate than you in life, then the fear is you will start to find Allah's favors upon you insignificant. You'll take them for granted and you'll become ungrateful to Allah. And tazdaru ni'matullahi alaykum. You'll start taking for granted the ni'mah of Allah upon you. Always look at those who are less fortunate than you. And there is always someone worse off than you. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down as a comfort to the soul of the Prophet sallallahu and his heart. A story with eloquence, with some humor, with seriousness, with sadness, with loss. And then in the end, with triumph. Telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa don't worry. As I relate to you the story of Yusuf, he went through a lot of hardships. But in the end, after patience and taqwa, he became a king you are going to be victorious. This is only a short time. And Allah says to him in Surah Al-Duha, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَىٰ وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَىٰ The hereafter is better than you than this world, don't worry. And your Lord is soon going to give you things until you are pleased and satisfied. Until all this pain goes away from you. This is in Surah Al-Duha. Scholars believe that it came up, out also, it, it was revealed shortly after the grief of the Prophet ﷺ as well. <laughs> Did he not find you an orphan and he supported you and looked after you and comforted you? 
ووجدك ضالا فهدى. And if saw you astray and he guided you. And you know the rest of the duha. So now Allah relates to us the story of Yusuf alayhi salam in the best way. And listen to how Allah begins it. He says, Alif Lam Ra. Three letters. Three letters. Letters. They're nothing else but letters. It's, in fact, it's not even a word. But the way we recite it is like this. Alif Lam Ra. One of the greatest miracles of the Quran is that Allah makes a challenge that you cannot change this book. And look, letters in the Quran appear. Letters. And they can't even be changed. Letters. Maybe a word can be changed. A letter? Letter at least. I mean, a words are even harder. But letters are simple. They're just letters. It could have been Alif Lam Ha. Alif Lam Mim. But no, the Quran for 14 centuries still with the same letters in the same order because they have meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the meanings of these letters. These are the verses of your Lord which are clear. We have sent this Qur'an down in the Arabic language so that you may comprehend. The Arabic language is something amazing. Some scholars believe that the Arabic language actually was sent down from Allah. Some scholars believe this, that it was not made up here on earth. Unlike every other language, you can find, you can trace back that some place in time, it borrowed from other languages and it became your language. Now, in the Arabic language, there are some words which were borrowed, but they became Arabic words. <coughs> However, the structure of the Arabic, the grammar of the Arabic, the, uh, the original words of the Arabic, the majority of it, we can't even trace it back to any origin whatsoever. Forget about the English language. And I don't, know, I don't want to tell you what linguisticians call the English language. They call that this, this English language borrowed its letters and its words from all different languages. Now, Allah says in Arabic, the grammar of the Arabic is so solid, you cannot change it. In fact, if you change a letter or a syllable, it changes the whole meaning and you'll get caught out straight away. If you pronounce a word, there is only one way of writing it in Arabic. And unlike English, bought, is it B-O-T? No. Is it B-O-A-T? No. It's B-O-U-G-H-T. <laughs> Amazing. So these are words in English. Unlike in Arabic, you can't do that. Very precise, intricate language. I'm not going to give you too many examples because we don't have time for that. But then Allah says in the Quran, the next verse is in response to those who said, can't your Lord, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, can't your Lord bring a story in a proper way, you know, from beginning to end? He doesn't know how to tell stories. This is what they said about Allah. He doesn't know. Your Lord doesn't know how to tell stories. So Allah replied in this surah. He says, we tell you the best of stories, Allah says. We tell you the best of stories in the way that we have inspired them to you through the angel Gabriel. In this Quran. And there are information, there is information in there which you have never known before. We give you information of stories that no one before you has ever known, has ever related. And so Allah brought the story of Yusuf in a way that has never been told in the Injil, the Bible, before or in any other scripture. Yes, the story of Yusuf does come in the Bible, the, the New Testament. But there is information lacking in there which Allah brought in the Quran that no one has heard before, but for the first time. So what does Allah say? He starts with the story of Yusuf alayhi salam.
And then he says, كنت من قبل إلى من الغافلين. إذ قال يوسف إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم لي ساجدين. Behold, when Yusuf said to his father, this is how he introduces the verse, the, the story. Behold, when Yusuf said to his father, O oh my father, O oh my father, I have seen in my dreams 11 planets. Kaukab means planets. And the sun and the moon. I saw them all prostrating to me, making sujood on the ground to me. You see that the story is opened up with a dream that Yusuf alayhi salam saw. I wonder why Allah chose to open up the story with a dream. Can anyone guess? Okay. Naam. Because the clux of the miracle or the clux of the abilities which Allah gave Yusuf alayhi salam was being able to interpret dreams. Here, Yusuf alayhi salam sees a dream which he cannot interpret. But his father, who was a prophet as well, a Rasul also, Yaqub alayhi salam, Jacob, he knew that this dream he knew, almost knew, what this dream meant. He knew it had something to do with his brothers, Yusuf's brothers, but he couldn't interpret it well. This is a gift which Allah gave the prophets. But Yusuf السلام, had the gift of interpreting it to its perfection. But he does not know its interpretation right now. This is the only dream which Yusuf السلام, was unable to interpret until decades in his life, decades later in his life. And there is a reason why Allah kept this away from him. Because it is how his story is going to end, with this dream. It starts with the dream and ends with the dream. So this is the theme of his story, the dream which he saw. And Allah goes off in the Qur'an, speaking about, the words of Allah go off speaking in the Qur'an based on the dream. All of it's based on the dream. His father Yaqub said to him, My son, do not tell this dream to your brothers. Because if you do, they are going to plot for you a terrible plot. Hmm. Aren't they all his sons? Yes. Does he trust them all? No. Does he love them all the same? No. Because his brothers, Yusuf Aizam's brothers, they, did it, they were very jealous of Yusuf alayhi salam. You see, his brothers were born from another mother. He had ten brothers from another mother and one brother from the same mother. The one brother that was from his same mother's name was Binyamin, or Benjamin in English. His other brothers had different names. And they were older than him. Yaqub loved Yusuf more than all of them. And he actually, at times, he couldn't help, because he's a human, human being, but accidentally show his love a bit more to Yusuf Why? Not because parents are allowed to mistreat. You have to be just with all your children. And that's what Yaqub was. However, Yusuf Yaqub knew that he was a prophet of Allah and a messenger. And we normally automatically love the messengers of Allah more than anyone else. <clears throat> Number two, the actions and the morals and the character of Yusuf السلام, far exceeded his brothers. Far more. The thing that we can learn from this is, are we as Muslim parents allowed to love our children in different levels, different standards? Yes. We can love them in different levels because we don't control our hearts and love comes from the heart. Sometimes a child may treat you bad. You can't control that love. And a child treats you better, 
your love increases for that child. You can't help it. But the treatment to them has to be just and equal. I think last week I, or the week before I told you about a man who entered for the Prophet ﷺ. He saw him holding his boy he, he, and the man sat down and placed his boy on his lap. And then the man's daughter entered and the man placed his daughter on, his, on the floor beside him. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ma adalt. You did not, you were not just in your treatment to your children. You made your daughter sit on the ground, but you valued or favored your son by placing him on your lap. Be the same. Do the same. Yaqub ﷺ treated them all the same. However, his children, the others, they had a wickedness in their heart, unfortunately. And they, had a rigid, they were rigid and harsh in their approach. The Prophet ﷺ tells us an authentic hadith that when Allah created Adam ﷺ, He created him from the different soils and textures of the world, of the earth. And this is why you have people with rough personalities, soft personalities, weak personalities, strong personalities, and so on. These are traits which Allah knows best people are born with from there at the time they are born. This doesn't mean that gives us a reason or an excuse to follow these desires. So if you're born with a harsh personality, it doesn't mean you have to obey that harsh personality or the soft personality. It doesn't mean you have to always obey that soft personality. But this is your test. Each one of us has a test of some sort and we need to rise above it. These brothers happen to come from that type of a soil that type of a clay. They were very jealous brothers. Allah says in the Quran that Yaqub said to his son Yusuf, Inna shaytana lil insani mubin. Son, don't tell your brothers they'll plot a terrible plot. The shaytan, as a matter of fact, the shaytan is a very clear enemy to the human beings. A shaytan is your enemy. Allah tells us he is your enemy and then he says فَاتَّخِذُوهُ adua." Take him as your enemy. Never take him as a friend. The shaitan whispers to you from places you least expected. But the shaitan only invites you. The shaitan reminds you of your desires. When you wake up for fajr, prayer, the shaitan whispers, tells you Give your body a rest. Set the alarm clock for another half an hour. It's all right. It's still time. You go to sleep. Again, he comes back at you until the sun rises. Then it's easy to wake up afterwards. Or maybe you don't care. The shaitan doesn't care anymore either. Or he tells you, you know what? Pray to Allah tonight and stay up all the night. He'll whisper to you this. Stay up all the night. Pray to Allah. Oh, what great rewards there are in Layl, Salat al Layl, night prayers, Tahajjud, and Qiyam. And then one hour before the Fajr, he says to you, Your body deserves a sleep. It is a sunnah to give your body its comfort. So give your body a sleep a little bit so you can wake up fresh for Fajr. You sleep, and then the time comes and you're too tired to wake up. The shaitan says to you, Sleep a little bit more until the sun rises. He busied you with the less important things than the most important things. Salat al-Layl became more important than Fajr prayer. So the shaitan does that to us. He makes you think that little actions are better than bigger actions. He makes you distracted. Whereas Allah tells us that there is nothing. In the Hadith al-Qudsi, there is nothing that I made that I love more than what the compulsory things which I have made upon my servants. The compulsory things are the most beloved to Allah. So the shaitan has many ways. I'm not going to go into that too much. But he is our enemy. And he works with you step by step. He doesn't bring haram to you to your, foot, to your doorstep. He doesn't bring you the alcohol tell you drink. He doesn't bring you the woman to your home and tell you make zina with her. He doesn't tell you. All he does is he works with you step by step until finally, gradually, your own desires take over. So the shaitan knows this. Allah tells the Quran that Yaqub said to his son, the shaitan is a clear enemy. He is going to lead your brothers astray. So hide this information. This is also a lesson from, for us that if a Muslim sees that there is a danger or assumes that most likely there is a danger, if they reveal a piece of true information, truthful information, 
then you, sh then it is, then you must hide it and reveal it later on where it's more appropriate. Some people, they, go to, they, say, they say things that hurt other people. And then they turn around and say, but it's the truth. It's the truth, whether they like it or not. In, according to the Muslim's character and according to the Quran, according to this verse here, not every truth must be said at every time. You must have wisdom and think. This is why Allah says in Surah Al-A'la, Sabih Isma Rabbika Al-A'la, in the, in, in, in the beginning of, in the middle of the, of the surah, Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِن نَفَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى Remind, the true remind is like, teach the message, remind of Allah, if you know at the time that you're reminding it, or if you know that who you're reminding it to, if you know that the reminder will benefit. In other words, say the right thing at the right time as much as you can. Or as those scholars say, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مَقَالٍ For every position, there is an appropriate word to say. So use wisdom, my dear brothers and sisters, and especially if there is a danger to yourselves, you are allowed to hide, make something called taqiyya, to hide the truth about yourself if, there is a, if your life is in danger. If you are endangered of a plot from people who you know, uh, most likely they are enemies, then you can hide the truth until the time comes. But otherwise, we are obliged to teach the truth. Otherwise, Allah tells us that Yusuf السلام, had great forefathers before who were prophets, including Ishaq and the rest, and Ibrahim. السلام. Then Allah says about his brothers one day, his brothers got together the ten without Benjamin, without Benjamin. And they said to each other, it seems our father has gone crazy. He's lost. He loves Yusuf more than all of us, a terrible love. This can't, this can't be. This can't be. He loves him more when we are a larger group. We're from the different mother. And we are a bigger group, bigger children. We can support him more. It's not fair that he loves him more than us. He should love us more than him. So they looked at their numbers. They looked at their... Uh, SubhanAllah, even though they were, they were his brothers from the same father, just because they were from a different mother, khalas, the shaitan comes and, and creates in your mind a difference between you and another people. This is why there are problems between nationalities, races. That's why there's racism, nationalism. Before World War I, we didn't have different flags. After World War I, they divided us, my brothers and sisters. They divided us and they started with the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire was a Muslim empire, it wasn't a Turkish empire. It was a Muslim empire. It was an Islamic Khilafah. But they turned it into Turks. They made Turkish, then they made Lebanon by itself, and they made Palestine, and then they made jo they kept Jordan on its own. They said Saudis on its own. They said uh, Syria's on its own. Uh, all these different. They started dividing all these once this big empire into different flags and nationalities, and they created nationalism between us. They are the ones who caused the trouble and the problem between in the beginning between Turkish and Arabs, and this is why there is still animosity till today among the ignorant, among the Arabs and Turks among other different nationalities. I don't want to mention them all, but we all know about many other different... I just mentioned Turkish and Arab because I'm an Arab, and, and uh, we, we, uh, I know that you know, with, with the uh, Turkish there was this animosity before. But there also exists with other nationalities and races. But as for the Muslims, it doesn't matter where we're from. We are all brothers and sisters in Islam. In Lebanon, where I where my fathers come from and I come from. If you married a woman from a different village, you're considered an outsider. Village, village. Like saying pre, uh, meadow heights and broad meadows. You married someone from broad meadows, you're an outsider. How could you become a stranger to us? You betray us. And the, there's enmity. You're considered an outsider. Why? So this... The brothers of Yusuf did this. And look at the tiny difference. Just different mothers, that's all. 
And what is it? نحن عصبة We are bigger, stronger, older, larger. So we don't take pride in our muscles or our intellect or our wealth or our bloodline. Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab, he's in hellfire. Allah said, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. Allah cursed and used harsh language against Abu Lahab and his wife. And they're the uncle. He's the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. So what? Only in righteousness. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ O oh people, we have created you into, from a pair of male and female, and made you into nations and tribes, so that you may come to know one another. Verily, the most honored among you in Allah's sight are the ones who are most righteous. Allah is all aware of what you are doing. So, no difference between any person and another except in righteousness. And only Allah knows this. And there is no difference, as the Prophet ﷺ said, لا فرق لعربي على أعجمين إلا بالتقوى. There is no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab, a foreign person from the Arabs, except in taqwa, in righteousness, God-fearance. They said, out of jealousy, kill Yusuf. Kill him. Kill him so that his father will no longer see him again and he'll forget about him. Get rid of him. Allahu Akbar. Enmity based on jealousy. Who knows who is the first one to follow the desires of jealousy ever? Shaitan? You're close. Who? Not Qabil, no. He's closer to Shaitan. Iblis. The king of the Shaitans. Iblis. Iblis, the Shaitan, yes who was with the angels, the rank of the angels. And he had jealousy from Adam salam, which led him to proud, proudiness, pride, haughtiness. Okay, you all know this. And Rasul Sallallahu said, Beware of jealousy, for it burns away your good deeds just as fire burns away wood. Narrated by Bukhari. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْحَسَدْ فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدَ تَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ كَمَا تَأْكُلُ النَّارُ الْحَطَبِ فَإِنَّ الْحَسَدَ يَأْكُلُ الْحَسَنَاتِ كَمَا تَأْكُلُ النَّارَ الْحَطَبِ Beware of jealousy, for jealousy eats away your, your good deeds, just as fire eats wood. So they said, kill him. Jealousy can lead to killing. Jealousy can lead to killing. And it starts as, and it ends up in hatred. Subhanallah, this exists between relatives, families, friends, brothers and sisters. I know of them. I know of them in our communities and societies. Wallah, it's very sad. Very sad. Wallah, she didn't say salams to me. Did you see the way he looked at me? He looked at me. He gave me a shifty look. Did you see her? What's up with her? She gives me a greasy. Well, I'm going to grease her off. Why did he say that word to me? What have I ever done to him? I will never call him until he calls me. He doesn't say salam to me. I will not say salam to him. Who does he think he is? Did you see the way he passed by me? He didn't even look at me. Okay, okay maybe he didn't see you. No, he did see me. He saw me. But he didn't want to look at me. Khalas, the shaitan gets to you and create. And this develops. You know, if you keep that in your heart and you don't open up about it, it builds and builds. And in every information you hear about that person, you only think about it in a negative way. So you get bad assumptions. What that develops in? A bigger problem. They hear about you, you hear about them. Bigger animosity. Uqsimu billah wallah. I know of people, very strong relationship, like very close in their blood, for 20 years. How many years? 20 years, they did not talk to each other. And they had children, and their children didn't even know each other 
for 20 years. Why? Over worldly things? Nasallallahu al-'Afiyyu. Ask Allah to forgive us. Mend your ties and your relationships, my dear brothers and sisters. In the story of Yusuf is a clear example of this. His own brothers said, "Kill him. Get rid of him." Uqtulu Yusuf. Another one of them said, "No, no, no. Itrahuhu ardan. Throw him in a land and exile him. Yakhlu itrahuhu ardan. Just throw him somewhere. Let him die alone." So instead of slaughtering him, get him, throw him somewhere because he was still a child. He was only about nine or ten years old, or eleven. Yusuf alayhi salam. And they said, throw him in the desert, throw him somewhere in the, in the forest. Maybe the wolf will eat him. Maybe someone will take him. Maybe he'll die of starvation. Just get rid of him. Allahu akbar. Jealousy can lead to that much hatred. Allahu akbar. One of the brothers, and I think it was the youngest of them, who had a little tiny bit of mercy, tiny bit towards his brother Yusuf. He said. Don't kill Yusuf. One of them said, "Don't kill Yusuf." But throw him in the well, in the bottom part of the well. يلتقطه بعض السيارة يلتقطه بعض السيارة إن كنتم فاعلين. Maybe someone who's passing by to fetch water from the well will get him, and at least they'll look after him. Turn him into a slave, or adopt him as a son, or something. But at least, you know, keep him alive. But he'll still be gone. So that's as much mercy as they had. That's as it. So they went to their father, and they thought to themselves, "How are we going to convince our father to take our son?" I want to show you how the shaitan helps you when you're plotting fitna, especially against the prophets of Allah. They agreed to have a unanimous request. They said, "Our father, why don't you send Yusuf with us, our brother, tomorrow when we go out to do our work in the in the in the, in the fields, and we'll look after him." Obviously, Yaqub alayhi salam was overprotective, so he said, "I fear that you might get too busy in the fields, and a wolf." Might come and take him, because Yusuf Hasan was so small, a wolf can take him away. Eight years old, maybe. His brother said, "No, father, how can a wolf take him when we are a osba? We are a large group." Huh? Listen, they're recalling what they said before. Our father loves him more than us when we are a osba. We are a large group. Now here again, they're mentioning it. Oh, father, how can a wolf take him when we are a osba? Reminding their father that we are a large group, we are more important than him. Love us more, as though they're giving him another chance, hinting to him. But this is the evil. So they convinced him. They said, if a wolf eats him, and we are a osba, we are a great group, then we are truly a losers. We don't deserve. We don't deserve any goodness. So they convinced their father, and he sent him. With their brothers. Now, this is not in the Quran; it is from different narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That on their way, Yusuf Alayhi Salam, he loved his brothers, and he trusted them. He trusted them to a certain extent, except for what his father told him. But as a child, seven, eight, nine, ten maximum, you know, you're innocent. You look at your brothers; they're going to protect you. It says on the way he started to play around them, and each time he went to one of them, he went to the smallest one. He started poking him and pushing him. So he went to the older brother, complaining to him about the smaller brother, and he started poking him and pushing him as well. He went to the third one; he did the same thing, fourth, fifth, until he finally reached the oldest one, and the oldest one resented him and pushed him away too. So they started pushing him and bullying him around, and each time he complained to another, the other would resent him too. Until finally they reached the well, and they surrounded him, and they took off his shirt. I'll tell you why in a minute. They took off his shirt, so it was bare from the top, and that's when he realized, alayhi salam, that his brothers had plotted to do something evil to him. They brought Yusuf alayhi salam. 
and they put him on the edge of the well. As they were doing so, obviously a child struggles. What are you doing to me? They're going to struggle. They're afraid. So he's struggling. You can imagine. And he's appealing to them. Please, please, why, what did I do to you? Why are you doing this? And they wouldn't reply to him. So they threw him in the well. He fell to the bottom with so much pain. It says that there was water in there and there were some rocks. So he climbed up on one of the rocks and sat alone in the darkness. Ghayabat al Jub means the darkness of the well. Like you can't see in there. So he was either going to die if no one finds him there and he can't climb out so deep or someone will bring him out and they won't even know what they're holding. And his brothers left him and went away to their father. The reason they took his shirt is because they went and got some blood from a goat which they slaughtered and placed the blood of the goat on the shirt. They came to their father and they put on an act as if they were crying. Allah says in the Quran, They came to their father in the evening crying. Which means, they said, O oh Father, we were going about in our work on the fields, and we forgot Yusuf behind us playing as he was playing. And the wolf came, snatched him away, and he ate him. And we know that you're not going to believe us. We know that you're not going to believe us. When a liar, how can you tell that a liar is lying? He tells you the truth about themselves in a camouflage manner. He says, we know you're not going to believe us. As though they're telling them, uh, though, as though they're telling him, we're lying to you, dad. Don't believe us. <laughs> We know you're not going to believe us, even if we were truthful. <laughs> Allah made them stumble on that word. <laughs> even when we are truthful, see, even when we are truthful, you still don't believe us. So they're talking in general, but they actually stumbled. And Yaqub is very wise. He took the shirt and he looked at it. Allah says, they came to him with, a with his shirt and on it was false blood. Blood was not the blood of Yusuf a.s. Yaqub a.s. looked at the shirt and in the hadith it says, he said, what kind of an unusual wolf is this? He ate my son and took extra care not to rip his shirt. His shirt was still intact. So what kind of an unusual wolf is this? What kind of a merciful wolf is this? He eats my son and takes off his shirt nicely without ripping it. So Allah says that Yaqub immediately knew what had happened. He said, he said, no, your anfus, your desires have made something appear in the way that it is not. They, it, 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 has, it has drawn a picture for you that is evil and convinced you, the nafs. You know, you can convince yourself that evil is good. So he said, your nafs has convinced you that evil is good and you've justified your act. Jamil. Allah. He says, I exercise, I exercise immense patience and Allah will assist me against 
what you have described and done. Yaqub was an old man, he was weak. And as we said before, when you are in danger, you can hide the truth. But from that day, Yaqub was sad and he was never the same for many decades to come. As for his brothers, they went back to the well and they waited over there behind the trees and rocks to see who's going to come and get him. Allah says in the Quran, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ فَأَرْسَلُوا وَالِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهُ قَالَ يَا بُشْرَى هَذَا غُلَامٌ وَأَسَرُّوهُ بِضَاعَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ Which means, and then, uh, you know, a, 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 a passer-by came. And they went to fetch their water with their messenger. They sent out the person to fetch the water. As he was reeling in the, the bucket, he found a child in there. And he screamed, oh, what great news. This is a child. In those days, when you have a child, this is like a fortune. A fortune. You can sell them or use them as slaves. وَأَسَرُّهُ بِضَاعَ Allah says, they, they went and hid him inside their luggage as if he, they acted like as if it was just utensils luggage so that no one will know Allah says but he knew what they were doing now the brothers came about and they said hold on a minute you found a child so they said is he yours they said no 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 but yeah we're going to charge you a little price because we know and otherwise we're going to um, we're going to tell people about you in another in another narration it says that they said he is our brother uh, but you can take him on one condition. You've got to pay us for him. Allah says in the Quran, وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمَ مَعْدُودَةٍ وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ His brother sold him to these people for a few pennies. And they treated him as if he was worthless. In another narration it says that those people who found him sold him for a few pennies to other people and they treated him as though he was worthless. Next week, insha'Allah, or the next class that I have you, insha'Allah, we will continue the story of Yusuf salam from this point where he got sold for a few pennies while he was treated as worthless. And I end my class for today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for being here.